Hello, everyone. Welcome once again to Cave of the Cross Apologetics. I'm Patrick. And I'm Tony. And we are uh, in chapter number 12, The Fortunate Fall in God's Greatest Glory of Scott Christian's book, What About Evil? And uh, this is kind of his his idea. It's uh, it's what he has put forth as his uh, theodicy, most, right? most biblical-based yeah. uh, theodicy, uh, how, how God and evil exist together. Uh, what is God's plan for evil? To take him by surprise? Um, is he kind of having to deal with all us radical free will people, <laughs> or does he have an ultimate purpose that was even designed before the foundation of the world? That's right, and yeah. a plan. Yeah, yeah, and that seems to be um, what he is uh, has put forth. And so, uh, last episode, if you uh, remember, all the way back then, a week ago, uh, we covered kind of just his argumentation for. For his uh, for his ultimate uh, theodicy, mm-hmm. the greater glory theodicy, and so um, you want to just review that, real yeah. Quick? So yeah. he has three premises, and then his conclusion. So one, God's ultimate purpose to in freely creating the world is to supremely magnify the riches of His glory to all His creatures, especially human beings who alone bear His image. Second premise is God's glory is supremely magnified in the atoning work of Christ which is the sole means of accomplishing redemption for human beings. Three, redemption is unnecessarily uh, uh, unnecessary unless human beings have fallen into sin. And then the conclusion is, therefore, the fall of humanity is necessary to God's ultimate purpose in creating the world. Mm -hmm. So God's got a special plan in your life, and sometimes it's to suffer. That's right. (laughs) But, but, and the howevers and the therefores and the after the commas and after Genesis 3, there's a plan. That's right. Well, it, and, and it works the same way for Jesus Christ. God, Father had a special plan in his life, and it was to suffer. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. So right. we're not, we don't escape it. Why <laughs> we think we escape it, and we're he didn't escape special, it. Right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, but all of this is to ultimately bring God's glory. And so uh, he, he allows us to suffer uh, so that he can show different parts of his uh, his character to us that we wouldn't have available to us. And um, through the rest of the chapter, there are some very interesting points that Scott Christian brings up talking about um, kind of different aspects of this, of, of, of what it entails. And then uh, for the rest of the book, he brings up uh, uh, different uh, responses uh, to it and continues on through um, uh, see, seeing this in, in Scripture as well. So that's where we're at. And so... Uh, if you're following along with us in the hardcover book, we're on page 287 uh, for glory is God's ultimate end. Mm. So uh, Christian says that even though ex- evil uh, in, is an institution within God's good creation, it was not unexpected. Right. It so, so it kind of, right, it kind of intruded. It wasn't really, you know, it doesn't seem like it fits and that sort of thing. But, uh, but it, yeah, God yeah. wasn't surprised by it, right? The, 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 the serpent didn't escape his, uh, his <laughs> confines. And, That's right. Slithered by God, right. and then God missed him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> in, in between his meetings with, with Adam and Eve, he, uh, he, he doesn't uh, step out for a phone call, and it comes back, and everything's on fire. <laughs> it was not a risk that God took in order to preserve the libertarian free will of his creatures. Uh, Christensen has set forth uh, that before, and you can find previous episodes where we discuss libertarian free will and um, how it doesn't seem to be uh, uh, biblically minded. It certainly did not catch God by surprise, as though God could be subject to such a thing as surprise. Mm. It's one of uh, the things that make God God. He's not surprised unless you're open theist or some some weird thing like that. As we have already seen, it stands within the sovereign decree of God, and we covered this in chapters uh, 7, 8, and 9. This explains the fact of evil, but it does not explain the why of evil. Yeah, good. So there it is, right? It's It exists. Right. Right. Now what? <laughs> yeah. And so Christians tells us that, uh, you know, because its presence is so contrary to our moral sensibilities, that is the presence of evil, right, which are derived from God himself, we're sorely inclined to think that evil somehow diminishes the good purposes of God. That's the way it feels to us, mm-hmm. right? Because of that. And thus to understand God's purpose, he tells us in decreeing evil, we must kind of step back and look at his ultimate objective, right? That's what he suggests right. uh, yeah. in order to get a feel for this and understand it and perceive what God is attempting to do. Right. right? The Bible talks about 
uh, sin, uh, separation from God, separating ourselves as people of God from sin or the world. Uh, there seems to be uh, a two sides of a version of this, and uh, God seems to be on on um, you know this this one side, and He's uh, either uh, reacting or He's uh, He's He's having to to deal with this this hatred that He has for things out in the world that aren't His or aren't. Um, you know, aren't, aren't the way that he wants it. That's right. Yeah. So uh, God has a, uh, a manifold purpose in creation and providence, uh, purposes whose wide regions can never be fully charted. But all such lesser goals are subordinate ends to God's ultimate end. So what's the, the main purpose? So you can have all these kind of secondary uh, minor purposes or secondary qualities of, of, of why evil exists, but what's the ultimate end? And that's to bring glory to himself and everything he does. Mm. The magnif- magnification of God's glory is his ultimate purpose in creating the world. Right. Not just evil, the world in general. Right. God doesn't have to create the world. The, the world isn't uh, a necessary condition in of itself. Uh, God doesn't uh, learn love by creating the world or, or learn anything, or there's nothing that God is missing by not creating. He uh, uh, creates so that he can uh, magnify his glory to Ex- express yeah. himself, right. Right. which he didn't have to do, yeah. but he does so. Yeah. And so throughout scripture, uh, God's passion for his glory, uh, Christensen tells us is paramount, right? This is uh, his, uh, so he quotes Bruce Ware and uh, Ware puts it like this from the first verse of inspired scripture to the last chapter of revelation, God makes clear in 10,000 ways that the greatest value in the universe and the final end of all of life is the uncontested supremacy and unrivaled glory of, uh, of God alone, right? So God is eternally self-existent. Uh, he's self-sufficient, right? In the fullness of the unchanging perfections of his own Trinitarian being, and therefore he doesn't need to, as you mentioned, exp- you know, display his glory, but he's chosen to do that, right? Right. right. So that's, that's one of the reasons uh, also why um, the Trinity is such a good exp- explainer of who God is, because unlike other uh, monotheistic ideas. Um, uh, love seems to be a, a character quality that uh, is expressed or, or is talked about within those other religions. But it seems like in order to love something, he has to be in a relationship with, and therefore he has to make without being uh, a, a trinity uh, to uh, make something and express love and do it perfectly. So it seems to be a need that he must have creation in order to express it to that Whereas a Trinity, uh, he loves each member of the Godhead. Yeah, love already exists. Right. It's nothing that he has to create first and then so that he's able to, to participate right. in it. He already, for all eternity, has already participated in love. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So nor does he have any need to manifest his glory to us. It's, it's not a need that he must do. His glory has been perfectly manifested between members of the Trinity from all eternity. John seventeen five. Nonetheless, the triune God so delights in his own glory, expressed in the inner Trinitarian relationships, that he desired to turn to express the overflow of that delight towards the creature he freely made, especially those made in his image. Right. And again, this is, we talked about this before, but it seems to be something that you would actually want from a being such as this. Uh, you, you would want a being to reveal himself, to save us, to uh, magnify his glory so that you know who he is. And the fact that... Um, we talk about God as, you know, unsearchable and unchangeable and uh, uh, this uh, aboveness. Uh, it's, it's, it's always this uh, transcendent nature. Uh, it, it seems uh, difficult to grasp, and we would also expect that as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what is this glory? Right. What in the world are we talking about here? Well, Christensen tells us that God's glory can be defined as that unworldly divine <laughs> transcendence that dwarfs our position as creatures before the creator. He says it speaks to the weight and worth of God, right? And it, it encompasses the full panorama of the supremacy and unity of his divine attributes, right? Uh, it says that he is preeminent in existence and that the whole universe is filled with, uh, with the evidence of his importance and his solemnity. Right. And so the entire universe uh, is an explosion of God's glory. He quotes the psalmist here. Bless the Lord, O my soul. 
O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty, covering yourself with light as with a garment. And that's in Psalm uh, 104. Right? Yeah. Uh, yeah uh, the other day I, I was uh, going through the, the uh, human depravity that is uh, Twitter. And uh, there was a, someone saying like, oh, you're telling me that God you know, made this universe with you know, so many millions of light years and so many uh, particles and so many planets and you know, at the very center of this is you and you're special. And the Christian response is yes. <laughs> yes. That, that, that's, that's how amazing he is, is that he can make all of this and yet make something specific and intimate and focused. And uh, the, the, the other things magnify that glory even more. So it's not just, oh, we're so special because we're this, the only planet that God created. No, no, it's the only planet he created with where he put his image into it. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, from there, we're to expand out. All right. So, uh, unfortunately, though, we are not the center. Right. It doesn't seem mm-hmm. to be. That's the story that uh, that's being told in Scripture, mm. and uh, sometimes we resent that fact. <laughs> so, God resides in an immutable state of unfathomable infinite worth that invariably uh, elicits His delight in Himself. This directs us to a world that is radically God-centered. If God's ultimate end were merely to show love to his creatures or some other benefit to human beings, even our redemption in the cosmos would be man-centered. Right. It's like looking at a photograph. It, it, God is, is, is showing us uh, his, his uh, vacation photos, and we, we uh, sometimes get bored because we don't see ourselves in them all the time. <laughs> we just want the, the pictures where we're standing next That's, to God. Yeah, so, and this is important, and he's going to make this point here, but... You know, it's important that the whole universe and all the, all of God's creation is not man-centered, right. right? And sometimes we, you know, obviously to us, everything revolves around us often, mm-hmm. right? Uh, because that's how we see things, right? I'm seeing based on where I am and my what's going on with me, right? But that is not the whole purpose of everything, right? right? right. You're not as special as you think you are, yeah. but you are special. <laughs> This is revolutionary, since many Christians firmly believe that God has them at the center of his purposes, and we certainly must not dismiss the importance we play in God's plan. Right. But we are not the center, not by a long shot. Unfortunately for us, not unfortunately, but fortunately for us, God is the center. Right. We, right. We, don't want, we don't want the center. The center is where all the gravity goes towards, and, <laughs> and that, that's, that's, a, that's a big crunch on us. Right. Now, we are important. We are loved. God clearly, you know, sent his son to, you know, die in agony yeah. and, and that sort of thing for our, us, but we're not the center of it. Genesis 1 goes from, uh, he saw that it was good, and after he makes us, it was very good. It, yeah. It's a, a clarifier of, of that. It, mm-hmm. It's a, a special relationship. He talks in a Trinitarianly, let us make man in our own image. And so there's a, a special portion of God in us, and and that's uh, that's one of the reasons why we are so important is because we are reflecting characteristics of who God is that mm-hmm. no other creature does. All right. All right. He uh, he tells us that this is critical as we consider how evil comports with God's purposes. Uh, he notes John Frame. Uh, Frame says that so many traditional treatments of the problem of evil assume that God's ultimate purpose is to provide happiness for man. Right? Right. Yeah. Give us the garden. Let us lounge about. <laughs> and of course, that's not so. God's ultimate purpose is to glorify himself, right? Uh, we are wont to, to misconstrue the goodness of God. Well, he's so good. I guess it's all about me, right? No, that's not the case, right? Instead of goodness being essential to the being of God through whom every contingent good exists and is good, we think of God's goodness as essentially the power to provide and impart pleasure and person fulfilling states of affairs for his creatures, right? right? Especially me, right? <laughs> he says, Our thoroughly self absorbed mindset uh, spouts out God is good insofar as he meets the criteria for the fulfillment of my dreams, my goals, and of course, my never ending bucket list. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah, I just want to retire at the age of 26 and travel the world and have nothing to worry about. Uh, and that's good. Yeah, yeah. There's no way to get bored with that. It's a, a, a Twilight episode uh, uh, for for uh, 70 years now. It's a spoiler alert. But uh, <laughs> but a uh, uh, guy goes uh, to, to heaven, or he dies, and he goes to heaven, and he's like, oh, I, I'm, I'm always winning uh, the poker tournaments. I'm always, you know, uh, completely happy. And then after a while, he gets bored. 
and he's like, I, I need, I need something to change it up. And, and, you know, he eventually realizes that all his pleasure seeking, all his ability to win, all his boredom, uh, shows him to be in the other place. Oh, <laughs> and, and So it's like, you know, wow. but what we think yeah. that we always want, we yeah. always want to win yeah. the, the ponies or, or, uh, you know, the, the <laughs> poker tournament, uh, with, without, the without failure, without that, that, uh, that uh, that uh, the tension, the, 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 the striving, yeah. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. We uh, we 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 think we know, uh, but we have no clue. <laughs> yeah, we need that in this world. Yeah. So um, many are taken aback by the notion that God's greatest delight is in Himself, as the blessed, that is eternally happy God. First uh, Timothy one eleven says, "Does this make Him some cosmic?" egomaniac right right unfortunately yeah. we tend to project our own condition as human <laughs> beings on the unique self-satisfied in a trinitarian blessedness of the transcendent god uh you know he he relates to us and so we have uh kind of this idea of like okay well he's uh he's in an existence of of being before creation well what's before creation or you know he exists in time because we're creatures of time and we haven't experienced anything uh, in time and so that's when you get like open theists or or uh, um, um, kind of the the pagan idea of uh, God is everything and everything is God uh, but that's uh, not what the the Bible describes him as and so we have a hard time kind of putting ourselves out there because God is so unique he is so, such in a different uh, uh, state of being that we just we don't ha- we don't have the ability to grasp that with our imagination you know mm, it's mm. uh the the flat world you know how, how does <laughs> how does 2d shapes uh, interact with 3d shapes well you can interact it in two way but how do you tell a 2d shape to to think about 3d so you know when when uh, uh, um, quantum physics talks about 333 uh, dimensions i mean I, I barely know what four dimensions yeah, is let really, alone yeah. you know eight or nine or <laughs> 222 or whatever it is so when humans are self-centered, it's rude, unloving, and marked by sinful pride. That's right. exactly what it is. So God is other than we are. He's not like we are. And so obviously when we make us the focus, right. we realize that's ugly. Yeah. Right? This is why Dawkins always tries to say, oh, if, if there is such a God exists, then he, there's no way for him to be able to communicate with us. We, it'd be like us communicating with ants. Except if you make the ants, maybe you can create them. Maybe you mm-hmm. stick something in them yeah. or a, a way in order to uh, your knowledge of creating that ant to, to be able to communicate with it. Right. Like what we do with computer programs or something <laughs> like that. Uh, but w- why is this so? Why, why is it this uh, a mark of, of sinful pride? Well, uh, because we are unworthy of s- such self-attention. We simply uh, put are not the center. Or we are not God. Yeah, exactly. Right. So... And he gives us an illustration here, right? He says, only the sun qualifies to be the center of the solar system. No, no. See, I know we're at the center because the sun comes up, <laughs> and it right. rises, that's and right. it goes down. No, no, we're, no, that's that the is center not point, the right? way it works, right? Yeah. Only the sun qualifies to be as the center of the solar system. All the other planets must orbit the sun in deference to its glory, right? And, uh, you know, they're too minuscule in weight to occupy the center of gravity, and the solar system would kind of fly apart without the sun at its center. And likewise, no other creature could possibly displace the magic, uh, majestic creator as the center of all glory, yeah. right? That's that's what he wants us to see here. Right? Yeah. Pluto's still a planet. <laughs> it is in my heart. <laughs> so thus, God is the only legitimate self-centered being who exists, and everything else necessarily depends on him. There is no weakness or impertinence here. It's just, it's just kind of the fact of creation. It's just how how things are. We're 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 not we're 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 not the creator. We're the created. We're not the center. He is. Uh, you know, uh, the the hope doesn't rest in us to save ourselves. The hope is on God. And mm. Sometimes we take umbrage to that. <laughs> <laughs> if God were to take a greater pleasure in anything other than Himself, then that object of that pleasure would have the greater status and worth than he. Right. And, and we, we run into this conflict before of, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, you know, does, does God pull from the ether uh, just uh, random collections of, of rules and then he divvies them out? Or uh, is he using the hand that he's dealt with and so he, he's pulling from, from some arbitrary nature that he's just, he's just wanting to do? Well, out of those two, I'd almost like the arbitrary nature of it just because then it's God focused and there's nothing outside because there's something outside. If there's a card dealer that he's, de- he's having to play those cards, well then let's go find that card dealer and, and yeah. figure out 
who the house is. You know, <laughs> uh, so this is unthinkable that that that, the, that if God were to take greater pleasure in anything other than Himself, then that object would be uh, the, the the center and have a greater status. This is unthinkable. Right. Rendering God inferior to something He created, as well as making Him an idolater. Right. <laughs> you know that right. that's the, the kind of the first two commandments there of of making God uh, center and having no other gods before Him, and there's nothing greater uh, when you when you. Uh, when he swears, he swears only by himself. When he talks about being, he states, uh, you know, ego, I me, I am, or I, I don't remember the Hebrew, but I just don't remember the Greek. And so th- there's nothing that he can do to, to say, okay, there, there, there's something I, I'm appealing to that's above me. It's uh, God is always appealing before himself. When he, when he makes a covenant between uh, himself and Abraham, he puts Abraham to sleep and he takes both sides of the agreement of, he signs the contract for both parties because he knows Abraham is human, he's going to fail, and his progeny is going to fail. And he knows he will not. And he knows he wants to keep his word. Right. He 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 wants the 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 uh, Hebrews, the Israelites, to uh, go forth and be the center and uh, bring all people to himself, which is ultimately exemplified in in, in Christ in the church. Right. And so um, that that that's what we want to see. That's what we want to exist, especially in a fallen world. Yeah. Good. And uh, Christensen tells us that here's another irony, right? When we take our eyes off our pain and focus them on God's enormous and splendid being, the multitude of our pain, he tells us, shrinks exponentially, right? Exponentially. God is astronomically greater than the event of the most horrific evils that can inflict seemingly intractable injury on our soul. God is greater than that, right? And so to take refuge in him precisely when evil has appeared to take over uh, is to place uh, where hope is most amplified, right? Hope is made, uh, he he tells us, uh, meaningless without some seemingly futile uh, adversary desperate to be overthrown. Hope is not to uh, spurn the stubborn persistence of evil that threatens to overtake our lives, but to covet a redeemer who promises to overtake evil. Right. right. So that's the purpose of it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, how, how many people went to their death for this idea of who God is? Uh, you know, why, why was that a joy to some? Why, why was that uh, uh, counted not as loss? It, it, it seems like, okay, you can attribute it to religious fervor to the, to the highest degree, but it seems to be for, for all types of men, all types of women, uh, uh, rich, poor, uh, those in power or who had power. And then those who, uh, you know, were slaves, uh, th- those who had much learning than those who didn't, uh, there were, uh, many people that, that said, this is who God is. And I will die not to, uh, go against that creator. And so what, what spurns that on? It's, it's this high, this, it's a proper view of who God is, what he commands and what he commands is greater than what man can punish you for uh, disobeying, like uh, sprinkling uh, uh, incense on an altar for Caesar and uh, claiming him to be God. That doesn't seem if, if you're in kind of this atheist uh, uh, viewpoint, well, that doing that or not doing that is the same thing. So there's no point, but what, why is someone like Polycarp, unable to, he says, I, I, I cannot do that. Just taking a pinch of, of incense and putting it on the altar is defaming who God is. And so he has this uh, correct idea of the structure of the universe of God being greater and one where the creature, the creator creature uh, relationship. And so, um, that's, uh, that's, um, spurned the, the entirety of church history. And, uh, e- even when, uh, the church has has gone into the persecution game. It's it's always been an attempt to say this is who God is, and we should be following it. So. Yeah, yeah. While the, at the time that we're videoing this, we're in the midst of this uh, rumbling between Russia and uh, Ukraine yeah. and United States and all that kind Hopefully of stuff. Hopefully, it's rumbling still and not yeah. in a bigger way. Yeah. <laughs> right, and I guess we'll. Yeah. By the time some people watch this, it, they may know Although, that. Maybe that, I don't have to end this the video. Story. So, <laughs> so win-win either but, way. Yeah. <laughs> but I was reading the other day a, uh, a missionary uh, <laughs> newsletter, and uh, there were this uh, agency had sponsored several missionaries into Ukraine. And they were, wrote back to the agency and said, we're not leaving. 
God mm. has called us here. Some of them had planted churches there in Ukraine. And, uh, you know, our mission, our purpose is to serve the folks that God has called us to serve. Yeah. So uh, we're not we're not leaving. This is what God wants us to do. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Great. That's exactly uh, the, the God that we want to not only serve, but we would want to serve. That yeah. we, we want a God that isn't us. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and isn't all about us <laughs> right. and yeah. what, yeah, our happiness yeah. and that sort of right. thing. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, 295 t- talks about God's intrinsic and extrinsic glory. So there's, there's kind of two avenues of God's glory here. So for purposes, two important aspects of divine majesty stand out. God's intrinsic and extrinsic glory. So God's uh, intrinsic glory holds the place of preeminence. It speaks to the incomprehensible splendor and the majesty of the perfections and excellence of his attributes as they exist and are perceived within himself. So think about all the all the things that make God who God is. Now think about a being that is ever present everywhere and he's all powerful. I don't know what that means. Like mm-hmm. it, it's it, I, I can kind of have an idea, but uh, it can can. God take a, a banana and make it into an apple. Yes. How does he do that? I, I don't know the, 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 the power uh, thing that transforms one to the other. There's no, uh, there's no like the fly where he puts it in transport and the fly gets in and it becomes part apple, part fly or something like that. You know, the, the, wow. the, the omniscient uh, so, uh, of, of God. I, so I, would you eat it or kill it? <laughs> <right>. <laughs> make it plentiful like flies, but yeah, maybe it eats itself. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, all the qualities that make who God is. It seems like only God can hold this idea of who he is within himself because of who he is. So mm. it's, 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 it's unable to be uh, completely searched out. And we see this uh, in, in church history and even in the scripture. Uh, God did, does, did even more things that even if we spent all this time writing books upon it, you know, the, 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 the oceans turned to ink and every person's an author we still wouldn't, you know, we would run out of the ocean. That's how we d- uh, stop a uh, uh, global warming. Is, 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 is. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So right that's his God. intrinsic glory. So right. such glory is immutable, as James right. one seventeen right. says. It, it can't change, right? This is who he is. Right. This is part of his character, right. his nature, yeah. right? You know, yeah. God says, I lie. Well, he would wink out of existence because right. God is unable to lie. It's, it's immutable. It does not vary because it is essential to the eternal, infinite being of the Trinitarian God. Right. It's, it's, it's who he is. So that's the intrinsic glory of God. On the other hand, God's extrinsic glory refers to the uh, external manifestation of this intrinsic glory as it's perceived by us as rational creatures, right? So the external manifestation is what he tells us. How we perceive God's glory is his extrinsic glory, Mm -hmm. right? God reveals uh, different aspects of his character and attributes through his works in creation and providence. So in this regard, the intensity of God's extrinsic glory can uh, vary depending, you know, on the manner by which he seeks to display it. Right. So it can be to one degree or another degree, a greater degree or a lesser degree. The, the degree to which, you know, his creatures perceive it is is we we can perceive whether or how God is displaying that mm-hmm. extrinsic glory. Yeah. Right. And we see this unfold through scripture. What You know, why is the law given at the time of Moses? Uh, you know, why is why is uh, uh, an allowance for divorce uh, set up? Uh, why, why does kind of a Trinitarian notion exist in the New Testament rather than the Old Testament? This unfolding revelation of who God is, uh, is, is, is not a lie. It's not a contradiction. It's God um, manifesting himself uh, to uh, a certain people at certain times in a certain way and then building upon that so mm-hmm. that we, we learn at a slow, <laughs> at a slow rate there. Mm-hmm. So if everything magnified God's glory equally, we wouldn't be able to appreciate its splendor. If the divine glory that Moses encountered, which was not revealed in its fullness, was equal to the reflection of the glory of, uh, on his face that the Israelites experienced, then it would make no difference whether one saw the glory of God directly or not. So, All right, so this, there's a distinction here, how God chooses right. to display his extrinsic glory, right? Yeah. Sometimes he does it. Uh, you know, uh, brilliantly, we might say, and sometimes he, you know, 
uh, reserves it, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of displaying its glory. Right. And so his illustration here with regard to Moses. Yeah, I think right? this is a really, really good one to, yeah. to talk about the, the difference of it. You know, uh, Moses says, L let me see you. And he says, uh, you would certainly die if, if, if I uh, revealed to you in uh, a, a full on form uh, what I'm like. So I will hide you in the cleft of the rock. I will cover your face and I will pass before you so that you see only my back. Mm -hmm. And we see that also uh, with, uh, with Jesus uh, in the mountain of transfiguration, the, the apostles see a, 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 a smidgen of what he's like. John also has to be in the spirit in order to, uh, to experience uh, heaven and, and, and revelation. Mm -hmm. And, and, and we, we, uh, We've covered this before too. It's one of our most popular videos of of how can Moses um, uh, see God face to face? Scripture tells us, but also not be able to see God because uh, if if anyone were to see God, then he should surely die. That's how m magnificent it is. Is mm -hmm. is if we took the full brunt of God's glory of his his just mere presence, then we would be killed. Mm. And and we we see this again throughout Scripture. And one of my favorite passages in the Old Testament is uh, Isaiah 6, where, where he sees uh, the prefigured Christ uh, seated on the throne, the, 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 the Shekinah glory fills the temple, and he's, he realizes how sinful he is, and the angel comes and touches his lip with a hot coal and uh, purifies his mouth. He's standing in the temple of God like they had the temple uh, reflected here on earth, and he realizes how uh, bad he is, and mm -hmm. must be, must be uh, sanctified there, and uh, who who shall I send? Send me, send me. Uh, you know he he he, um, he gets his blessing there and, and and goes out into the, the world to essentially tell the Israelites, uh, I'm writing this message to the future remnant because there <laughs> there's no hope for you, but I still have to call you to repentance. And so if God appears uh, to limit the extent of His intrinsic glory, in uh, most instances He does this precisely in order to highlight its magnificence to His creatures at other times, right? right. So that's that's what He does. All right. Um, next, Christensen moves on to, uh, you know, supreme glory is located, and this is how God ultimately reveals his glory, right. in Christ's redemptive work. Yeah. Right? God's glory is magnified not merely when greater glories are compared to lesser ones, but especially when it is seen against the polarizing backdrop of its opposite. Right. So moral and natural evil. Mm -hmm. Right. So when it's seen against that, it's extremely magnified. Right. And therefore, evil is in a unique position to magnify the glory of God is what Christensen tells us. And of course, this leads us to our central question. Then, since God's ultimate end in creation is to magnify his extrinsic glory to his creatures, where is such glory most magnified? Mm. Right. Well, we, we've read the story. But it's at redemption. Yeah. <laughs> redemption reveals the med majestic character of God supremely. And it does so in the face of human weakness that demands divine justice, yet cries out for something more glorious, the grace of a redeeming God. Mm. And so why will the new creation be greater than Eden? You know, why, why is it that, that it, it talks about not just in a reestablishment of the garden or, or of, of the, the, the pre-fall world? Why is, it, why is it described in so much more greater detail? Why, is, why does fire purify it and, and then uh, recreate it? And it's new. It's made new heaven, new earth. Yeah, why, is it a, a, why isn't it a U and it's a J? Yeah, right? yeah. The, 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 <laughs> the story. The, the kingdom is set. Uh, Arthur is in his, uh, in his round table. All things are good. Uh, they, they go for the grail, uh, and uh, uh, Arthur loses it, and... Uh, well, there's there's no good to, to end to that story, but but if he were to find it and return it, uh, you know he 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 sits on his throne and breathes a sigh of relief. <laughs> That's not what happens here. It's even more so. It's even more magnified. So it keeps going up and up. Mm. That that uh, that uh, that U shaped is really a J shaped, yeah. And so, uh, why will the new creation be greater than Eden? Because the Redeemer Himself descended into the depths of the impossible predicament that the fall brought about and emerged an unprecedented victory. God enters his creation. That's yeah. it's uh, it's it's he humbled himself. He 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 uh, he um, subjected himself to to what humans experience and 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 evil and sin and torture and death. He did all that for an even greater purpose that that we wouldn't experience without. Yeah, evil. And, and so you know who would have 
thunk it, right? <laughs> right? How, God. you know, yeah. How in the world, right? Nobody would have expected that. And Christensen tells us that it was an inconceivable plan, right? Yet a grand stroke of divine genius. If the plot line were flat, right? Good followed by good and then more the same. He says there'd be no occasion for God to display his unwavering justice and his holy wrath against a recalcitrant world or his boundless compassion to the broken and especially his unexpected mercy and forgiveness toward uh, his wretched creatures, right? right? So if it was just good, 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 then we wouldn't be able to experience all that God is, all that he can do, what he desires to do with us and through us and that sort of thing, yeah. right? The, the incarnation, the life, the, the perfect life, the the death, the, uh, the fulfillment of the law, the the... Um, taking upon sin on the cross and ultimately not just the end of the story, but then a resurrection and then an ascension and then a, 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 a forever kingdom established that uh, reflects the, the, the minimal uh, Davidic kingdom uh, is even more glorified of uh, glorifying of God in that story than if he wouldn't have come. You know, God can reveal to us that, oh, I'm, I'm a good redeemer, but yeah. without the fall, yeah. what do I, what do I know of that? How <laughs> yeah. do I experience redemption yeah. if I don't have sin? Yeah. Okay. Good to know. Good yeah. to know, right? Yep. <laughs> yeah. yep. There, there's a wet spot on the floor in a room that you don't have access to. <laughs> okay. Good. Yeah. 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 So uh, Christensen tells us then that out of this depth, right, out of the depths of our wretchedness, um, uh, this is where the divine glory via the glorious Christ especially pours forth like a, you know, a blinding light from, from a dark dungeon, right? right? Yeah. Is what he tells us. Yeah. 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 Uh, and I, uh, my, my daughter has been watching a lot of uh, Pilgrim's Progress. So I'm, I'm getting a lot of those images still today is, is <laughs> you know, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the burden on Christian's back rolls down the hill as soon as he, uh, enters through the narrow gate and 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 uh, gets at the foot of the cross, and the, the the cartoon makes it look so burdensome that I'm like, oh, I just want you to stand up straight because it feels <laughs> feels like it is, and I, I I can imagine what that character feels like with with that burden off, and it rolls into the grave and is ultimately killed. So yeah. so uh, that that's ex- exactly kind of that. Oh, I I I I felt the weight, and now I don't, and so I have that ability to to reconcile that, and there there wasn't anything I could do to get it off my back. But it was ultimately God's plan and purpose uh, so that I may glorify him more and he can show himself uh, in his people. Good. So the next thing uh, Christensen asked the question, was the fall necessary? And I think we should probably leave it at that poignant point (laughs) and, and bring it back and talk about. You know what he has to say, you know, because if the fall was necessary, then God had to he do had it. He had to do it. He yeah. had to he send was his son. forced to do it. Jesus yeah. needed to come. Yeah. It was and, something that came know, about, and he was like, "Oh man, I need Plan B." Yeah. Jesus, yeah. your Plan B. <laughs> that sounds exactly like the God of the Bible. Yeah. Cool. Plan yeah. B, not. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for joining us. Uh, come back as we uh, finish uh, uh, our, our chapter twelve here, the fortunate fall and God's greatest glory, so we can figure out um, uh, what God needed to do or what he had to do or if he had to do it at all. So so thanks for joining us and uh, we'll see you next time. We'll see you next time.